It's February 2011 in democratic post-Saddam era Kurdistan. When youth started throwing rocks, the response was ferocious. From the headquarters of one of the main political parties, guards fired directly into the crowd. One teenage boy was killed. Dozens more were injured. It was the first bloody day in a standoff between the demonstrators and the authorities that was to last two months. In all, 10 people would lose their lives. 15 people with a gun, Klasnikov, uh, shooting directly at people. It must have been absolutely terrifying. It was. San Saravan is making a documentary based on his own experiences during the demonstrations in his native Sulaymaniyya, Kurdistan's second city. They were expressing their anger and very strong words like corrupt, corrupt, remember, do you remember Mubarak? But outside Kurdistan, no one seemed interested. The world was transfixed by the unfolding Arab Spring. The Kurds ousted their dictator 20 years ago. But their current elected rulers seem just as intolerant of dissent. Could events in Kurdistan today be a foretaste of things to come in countries like Egypt, Libya or Tunisia? People were sending letters, protesters were sending letters, but they, they, were, they get responded by bullets and by... Uh, torturing, arresting protesters every night. Zahir Mahmoud and his wife Khunsha Kadir have come to visit the grave of their son. Sirkiu was just 16 years old, still in school when he was shot dead on the 19th of February. That morning when he went out, I told him not to go. I told him that I had a dream that night. I said to him, Sirkiu, I had a dream. If they start shooting, don't go that way. Take another route. He said to me, Mother, you are right, but today many will get killed. I kept telling him not to go. He said goodbye. Sirkiu's parents say they know who killed their son. The men in this video, they say, are militias from Kurdistan's political parties. At least one of them can be seen here firing directly into the crowd. <laughs> Amongst them is Sirkiu, the one in the red jumper. He was rushed to hospital, but he died that night of his injuries. As well as the grief of a father who's lost a son, Zahir Mahmoud has been left with a deep sense of betrayal. He himself once fought for Kurdish independence alongside the very people that he now blames for the death of his child. The Kurds of Iraq gained their autonomy after a long, hard struggle. The result is a semi-independent state in which two democratically elected parties now dominate most aspects of life. They have their roots in the armed insurgency of the 1970s and 80s against rule from Baghdad. The men who led the fight against Saddam Hussein from secret bases in these windswept mountains are now in charge here. And they're promoting Kurdistan as a model of democratic governance for other people in the region who've recently overthrown oppressive dictators. But their popularity, their legitimacy today is based in large part on nostalgia, on the memories of heroic exploits of the past. Saddam Hussein's oppression of the Kurds culminated in 1988 in the chemical gas attack on the town of Halabja. Thousands were killed indiscriminately, men, women and children. But the fighters, known as Peshmerga, those who faced death, eventually drove Saddam out of Kurdistan in 1991 with the help of a no-fly zone imposed by the United States and her allies. Saddam Hussein's rule here came to an end 20 years ago, a full 12 years before the Americans toppled him in Baghdad. And in the towns and cities of Kurdistan, you can feel the difference almost physically. People here walk around without that residual fear of violence that you get elsewhere in Arab Iraq. Kurdistan is largely free from the kind of terrorist attacks that are so common in Baghdad and elsewhere. But for those who oppose the government, a climate of fear remains. Activists have been arrested and beaten up. 
journalists who publish unflattering stories have disappeared, even been killed. This is a recording of a telephone conversation last spring between a Kurdish minister and a reporter for an independent magazine which was supportive of the demonstrations. The minister is heard making threats against the magazine's editor, Ahmed Mira. He won't get away with it, the minister says. Do you know what I'm going to do to him, that bastard? I'm a Peshmerga. We are always under threat. Not a day goes by without getting some threatening phone call. Since the demonstrations were put down on the 19th of April, I've been in prison three times on the orders of the politicians. Without the court's permission, handcuffed, they took me from my office, beating me with pistols. At school, the younger generation, too, is taught to revere the Peshmerga. But these children can take for granted many of the rights and freedoms that their parents and grandparents had to fight for. Some young Kurds are becoming frustrated with the Peshmerga party's grip on power. Take Shana Abdullah, for example. She's well-educated with degrees from universities in the United States and the UK. But she's teaching here in this primary school because, she says, corruption and nepotism means she can't get a job in the local university. If you don't have the political connections, it's quite hard to find a job. In fact, it's quite hard to do anything. If I want to publish an article, or if I want to publish a book, you have to do it through the political body. You have to have connections as well. They control everything. They control education. They control the economy. Everything here is controlled. By if you want to find a job, you have to go through their uh, circles and find a job. Shana says that the protesters in Suleimania were inspired by events in Tunisia and in Egypt. Despite the Kurds' democratic freedoms, those in charge, she says, are simply not giving people like her a fair share of the country's resources. Everything they have done is for their own benefit. You know, they have bought islands in, in Europe, and I mean, they're buying supermarkets and hospitals elsewhere for themselves. They have bank accounts everywhere. Well, the money that's coming out of the city is not used for the youth here, or not just in Suleimania, elsewhere in Kurdistan. It's for their own benefit, and it's also for the people who are connected with them. If you're not connected with them, you're not benefiting from it. But there is another side to this story. The capital, Erbil, is a thriving regional center. They run their own affairs here, and it shows compared to the rest of Iraq, Kurdistan is secure and stable. And that stability brings with it opportunities that, for many, trump the protesters' grievances. The Kurds have fought for centuries to gain the level of autonomy that they have here today. And so there are plenty of people who are nervous about jeopardizing that by challenging the status quo that got them here, especially since, at the moment, there seems to be plenty of money to be made. Kurdistan has vast reserves of oil and natural gas, and all of those energy dollars are fueling a consumer boom. With that comes foreign investment and construction. Everywhere you look, there are new buildings going up. In this narrative, Kurdistan is the other Iraq, a regional success story to be emulated by other countries striving to move beyond dictatorship. We in the Kurdish leadership believe that if we have problems, we should not solve them through the use of force and violence, but rather solve them peacefully, democratically and through dialogue. If they do the same, then it will serve their interest, the interests of their people and their country. In February, March and April, ten protesters were shot. Uh, there was violence there. Why was that? Unfortunately, that was a bad thing to do. The Arab Spring had an influence on events. A group of people had permission to demonstrate peacefully that day. But after the demonstration, a few of them turned violent, leading to some being killed and wounded. On the 19th of April, after two months of continuous protest, government forces broke up the demonstration in Suleimania. They burnt down the protesters' tents and their makeshift stage and filled the central square with their own troops. Politically, that was the end. But one day, it will happen again. I'm sure about that. The amount of the frustration which I saw in the faces and the body language, it, it, 
easily could tell you it will happen again. You ask them peacefully, they didn't do anything. You ask them again, they use a gun. And this time, what would you do? Clearly, there is unfinished business here. Kurdish democracy is a work in progress. Kurdistan today may well be a model for what countries like Tunisia, Egypt or Libya could look like 20 years after their own Arab Spring. But as one Kurd put it to me, if they follow our example, they'll need another spring to sort things out.